Good morning and welcome to our service today, coming to you from the homes of members of the Church of Christ the King here in Kettering. My name is Eleanor Jeans, I'm the Associate Vicar here, and later on in our service we'll be hearing from Rob, our Vicar, who will be preaching on the next part of Acts 2 as we continue to look at those events of that first Pentecost. Wherever you are watching today, whoever you are watching it with, we are really pleased that you have joined us today. Maybe you're really enjoying joining in with people um, online for worship and that it makes it uh, more accessible for you for whatever reason that might be. Or maybe you are finding it difficult to focus and engage and for you, you long for the day when we can meet together and worship in person. Whichever is the case, there is no doubt, is there, that this is a really difficult time and that we all have different experiences and challenges. But I want to encourage you today because what is definitely true is that God is at work by his spirit. I'm aware of people being healed, of friendships and community growing, of people serving one another and I know that there are people joining us for our services online who haven't uh, walked into a church building for many years. If that's you we're really glad that you are joining us today. But as I said for some of us it's hard to focus when we're watching at a screen isn't it? So I want to encourage you this morning to join in with something using your hands. It's some very simple uh, BSL uh, just to help us as we say sorry this morning. We're going to use two words, unsurprisingly one of them sorry, and the other one is Lord. And the signs are sorry, Lord. It's like making an L in each hand, one back to front, obviously. So sorry, Lord. So after I say the words we really want to say, you could join in with sorry, Lord. If you've got children with you, do encourage them to join in with you as well. Let's pray. For the times when we are selfish and think only of ourselves. We really want to say, sorry, Lord. For the times when we are proud and think that we're better than others. We really want to say, sorry, Lord. For the times when we get cross or impatient with our friends and family. We really want to say, sorry. Lord. For the times when we are envious and not content with the good things we have, we really want to say, sorry, Lord. For the times when we act in ways which hurt others and you, we really want to say, sorry, Lord. And so may the Father forgive us by the death of his Son and strengthen us to live in the power of the Spirit all our days. Amen. And so as free and forgiven people, it's time to worship our amazing God. The one who leads us, who brings us light, who gives us peace, who doesn't let us go, who is just amazing. Let's praise him in song. My lighthouse, my lighthouse, shining in the darkness, I will follow you, oh, my lighthouse, my lighthouse, I will trust the promise, you will carry me safe to shore, safe to shore, safe to shore. Save to show In my wrestling and in my doubts In my failures you won't walk out Your great love will lead me through You are the peace in my troubled sea Whoa. You are the peace in my troubled sea Silence you won't let go In the questions your truth will hold Your great love will lead me through You are the 
peace in my troubled sea. Whoa, you are the peace in my troubled sea. My lighthouse, my lighthouse, shining in the darkness. together. They had stuck by one another, whatever the weather. When things had gone bad, when things had been good, they had stuck by each other as only good friends could. But now their best friend had gone away. And they weren't sure what to do when they met that day. They talked and they listened and they prayed and had a rest. But they weren't too sure just what to do next. When they heard a loud noise suddenly, it sounded like a gale was hitting. And little flames of fire came into the room where they were sitting. The flames landed on them, but they didn't get burned. They started to talk in languages that they'd never even heard. They went out into the street, saw lots of people everywhere. And though there were lots of strangers, they didn't feel scared. They started saying things and everybody could hear. And soon there was a crowd of people lending them an ear. Well, the day went on and people's lives were changed. It was the birthday of the church and things would never be the same. Ever since then, the church has spread and spread. And we're here today because of what those people did.
trinity by invocation of the same the three in one and the one in three i bind them to myself today the power of god to hold and lead god's eye to watch god's might to stay god's grace to meet my every need
Hi, this is Andy Hemman here. I'm married to Colette. We have three children and I work with Youth of the Mission here in Cambridge. We came here about 10 years ago to help establish YWAM Cambridge and it truly is up and, up and running now. Uh, we've been running as an independent charity now for about three years and uh, we have been able to continue through this lockdown period. In fact, recently we've been offered the use of a large house. So we're asking God, how do we fill it? In terms of leadership, and I'm part of the leadership team here that we have in Cambridge, this has been a really sweet time of coming together. I've sensed more unity, more real listening to one another, and greater sense of space for what God wants to do through us here in Cambridge. As I mentioned, we've got a leadership school of which I'm a part and been contributing to that quite actively. And we, we've got a Bible school that we've been able to continue as well. And both of those graduate in about two weeks' time. Pray for us in this next September that we'll make wise use of the properties that we have to train young people to go to the nations and follow the will of God for their lives. About a year or a couple of years ago, my grandma died. and She was at the ripe age of 105 and she left us a small amount of money. We're going to use that money to expand or extend our house. One of the things that we've been doing in the last year or so is investing in the youth of our church that we go to. And every week they have been coming round, obviously not during the lockdown period. But we feel that Grandma's gift was making space for people. We want to continue making space for people in our own physical home, but also in our hearts. We've been pastorally supporting people through this time, but we want to physically provide a larger environment for more people as the lockdown ends to come and share with us. Um, would you pray that we'll be making space for the right things in the future, that God will guide our plans for the growth of our house and that God will continue to keep us together as a family through this time. Thank you so much for the prayer, love and support that you've shown for us over extended years. It's a vital part of making possible for us to do what we are doing. Let us pray. In my distress, I called upon the Lord. To my God, I cried for help. From his temple, he heard my voice and my cry to him reached his ears. God of love and hope, you made the world and care for all creation and yet the world feels strange right now. The news is full of stories about coronavirus, schools, racism and crowds of people. Many have anxieties about health, their loved ones and their jobs and security. Many feel isolated and yet are scared to venture out. Be with us in our worries and help us to find some peace. Father God, we pray for our schools recently reopened to some pupils. We pray for protection for those working in schools and for the children attending them. We pray for the leaders having to adapt to rapidly changing circumstances and that they would make wise decisions for the future. We pray for all children and young people who are not in school, college or university at the moment and who are anxious about what the future might bring. We pray for all those working on the front line and for the scientists who are trying to find ways to fight the virus. We pray for our politicians, help them to make wise decisions. We pray for protection from the virus for each one of us. Be with us in our worries and help us to find some peace. Father God, in your eyes, all people are equal. Help us to see each other the way that you do. Lord, give us your wisdom to resolve the inequalities in your world. We ask you to bring peace and healing to all those in the church community who are in hospital, unwell or in need. We remember at this time Mary and Dennis Franklin and Claire Handley's dad. And in a moment of quiet, others known to us. We remember those recently bereaved and ask that you would bring comfort and peace to their families. 
We remember Mary Frey, Susie Gray, the Williams family, and Val and Mike Curtis. And in a moment of quiet, others known to us. We celebrate and give thanks for the safe delivery of a baby girl to Kelly and Ty Augustine. Thank you that you are always with us and that you are our hope and our friend in whatever we face. Keep our hearts always in your love. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Hello, in case uh, you don't recognise me, my name is Rob, uh, I'm the vicar here at Christ the King, uh, and I'm delighted to have with me uh, today Richard, Richard Amponsa, who is a member of our church. Richard, I wonder if you'd just like to uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yes, thank you, uh, Rob. Yes, uh, so as you said, yes, my name is Richard Amponsa. Um, I live with uh, Sandra, my wife, and our two sons in uh, Rothwell. I work in the NHS, and we normally come to the nine o'clock service. Uh, before moving to, to uh, Northamptonshire, we lived in uh, Hertfordshire. We moved here in 2005, and I've been coming to Christ the King Church since 2011. So that's... Uh, Fabulous. Excellent. Us. Um, one of the main reasons I wanted to talk to you today is that... Uh, Obviously, we've had the George Floyd uh, murder in recent weeks, and mm. it seems to me that it's opened up wounds in our society, which actually have always been there. Uh, yeah. And I'm interested in knowing something of, of your experiences um, yeah. being a black man uh, in England, uh, good and bad, I guess. I see. No, thank you. Um, I think, can I just start off by saying my Mine and my family's overriding experience of living in England has, has been a very positive one. You know, overall, it's been a very positive one. Uh, I don't think there's any black person in, in the country who hasn't, in some shape or form, experienced some form of racism, whether it's, you know, blatantly or subtly. So we have, but I have to say, I need to qualify it by saying, you know, my overriding experience of living in this country, mine and my family's been very positive. We felt very supported. Uh, we have friends who we trust, uh, we pray together, share together. So that's it. But in terms of some of the experiences, I remember um, our 21-year-old son, when he was in primary school, uh, got told by another pupil, I don't like black people, I don't want you to sit next to me. Mm -hmm. uh, and this was primary school, which was a bit sad because you think, gosh, you know, then that for me was about, it showed that people aren't born racist it is something that they they are they, they they learn from other people because i mean how would a child like that so it just for me it was it was just a pointer to the fact that parents and people that raise children have a responsibility to make sure that they're you know they're they're, they're noticing these things and they're rooting it out yeah. uh, again my teenage son last year he he, he, was, he is a member he was a member of the a student leadership team and they were organizing a fundraising event in Kettering and he was together with a group of about six or so of his friends they were all white and uh, they were in Kettering town center going towards the venue uh, for the event and he was stopped by police and he was searched uh, he was together with a group he alone was singled out stopped and searched uh, so he called me and said dad guess what happened I said what happened he said, I was just talking and said by police. I said, really? He says, yeah, that's what happened. I was with, you know, and he mentioned the friends who I know. They've been friends for many years. So that's, again, one of the things that just uh, leaves us all taste in the mouth. That, mm. you know, he, 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 he dealt with it well. Uh, but just imagine, you know, broad daylight, being stopped, single, single, uh, singled out and searched. Uh, so those are some of the things. And I remember Sandra, my wife, when I lived in Cyprus in 1996, she came to visit, and every time, without fail, that she went to the local shop, she was followed around, literally followed around. Mm -hmm. uh, they specifically detailed a security person to follow her around, you know, like you know, she was going to shoplift or something. So those are some of the things. And, you know, I'm a psychiatric nurse. I've had lots of abuse. 
I sometimes excuse that by saying it's because people maybe are experiencing acute distress in their mental illness or something. But, you know, but as I said, half our own experience has been good and positive. So I try not to dwell on the negatives. <laughs> but it's very helpful for us to know that because those experiences, if you never know when they're coming, of being um, in the minority and being somehow mistrusted. Yeah. Uh, because the only time when I've been in the minority, when I've travelled in predominantly black Africa, I've almost mm. been the odd one out, but been yeah. looked up to rather than looked down on. It's a very different yeah. feeling. Um, so, that, oh, bless you, that, that, that can't be easy. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm guessing many of us um, who are watching this would say we're not racist, mm. um, but may possibly have subconscious racist attitudes because mm. you know, we've grown up in a predominantly white culture. Yeah. I wonder how can your thoughts on how those of us who are white, how can we best um, further the cause of anti-racism? Mm. I can think of two things that contribute to, you know, to racism. I think one is indifference, but basically it doesn't touch me. So, you know, I, I, I don't really care. I and mean, a lot of people, I haven't come across anyone who would say, I don't care. But I think in our attitude of indifference and not saying anything or doing anything, even when we observe it, we are communicating by our actions that we don't care. So I think that indifference is, is a big thing. Uh, so I think it's about just recognizing, especially as believers in Jesus Christ, that we, we should be on the side of the oppressed and the marginalized. So I think indifference is a big thing that we need to address. Um, the second thing I think we can do is to just uh, address uh, our ignorance. And I think for me, in this day and age, the internet age, it's willful ignorance almost because there's so much material out there. You know, lots of social experiments have been carried out. There's so much you can learn. I mean, sadly, in this time, there's a book by a black British author. The title of the book is Why I Stopped Talking to My White Friends About Racism. Mm -hmm. And it's apparently the top of the charts now in the non-fiction category um, because of what is happening. People are just going out and trying to educate themselves and trying to learn. Mm -hmm. How can I consciously do things that don't just, you know, that mean I'm, I'm actively forwarding the course and uh, maybe doing my bit to chip away at, at, at that those racist attitudes so i think uh, yeah address our indifference uh and and educating ourselves is a good place to start i think that's very really helpful as i was in contact with a um uh, a friend of mine today who is a uh, a black leader of a church and her staff team is predominantly white uh, mm. and she was saying to her staff team you need to take the lead on this um mm. because actually it's those of us in the majority who need to be um speaking up um, and actually recognizing the issue and speaking up for those in the minority. I think absolutely right there. So, um, yeah, well, bless you. And thank you very much for, for uh, uh, helping us to think a little bit more uh, and giving us some food for thought as well. We really appreciate you and uh, appreciate having you part of our fellowship. Um, thank you. And uh, not only doing the interview, but um, I know you, you, you and your whole family are about to go and do the reading for us as well. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, Richard. Thanks, Thank Rob. God bless you too. Brothers and sisters, we all know that the patriarch David died and he was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on earth that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of the fact. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand, until I make your enemies a footstool at your feet. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in, this, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. 
Their promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray as we reflect on God's word. Father God, thank you for the gift of your word. Thank you for the gift of your spirit. Thank you for the gift of Jesus. As we spend some time reflecting on this passage now, I pray that you would open our hearts to receive what it is that you have to say to us. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So are you kind of person who instinctively looks backwards or more instinctively looks forwards? It doesn't necessarily have anything to do with whether you're an optimist or a pessimist. Um, if you look back, you might be the kind of person who looks back with nostalgia. Uh, those days were great. I miss them. Or you could look back with regret or saying, thank goodness those days are over. And conversely, if you're the kind of person who instinctively looks forward, you might be looking forward with great hope of what might come along. Or you might be looking forward with great fear. Um, or uncertainty. Yesterday I was talking with a church leader who says that periodically in his church uh, they talk about the analogy of uh, driving a car and say there's a reason why the windscreen is bigger than the rear view mirror because actually seeing what's in front of you is more important than seeing what's behind you although of course both are important when you're driving a car and of course Looking forward uh, can sometimes seem as if there's a dense fog in the way or maybe there are obstacles uh, in the way. Well, Peter's sermon, uh, remember, we're coming on to the second part of the sermon uh, today. Eleanor took you through the first part last week. Peter's sermon looks both backwards and forwards. Um, and remember, this sermon was not... Uh, a planned thing. He did spend lots of time uh, poring over the books and then think, right, today I'm going to uh, preach this. It was preached in response to the dramatic events of that first Pentecost, uh, in response to the wind that came, uh, the encounter with a greater power that people saw, in response to the fire. Fire, of course, heats things up, it softens things, it burns up dross as well. And in response to the languages, the, the supernatural gift of communicating in culturally appropriate ways with a huge variety of nationalities. So on this day, God has exploded out of the box, so to speak. And people gather because they can't ignore what they've seen. So Peter looks backwards and he looks forwards. And this period in history... Uh, that first Easter through to the first Pentecost is com is utterly pivotal. See, Jesus is, as Peter says, is both the culmination of the past, but also the founder of a new future. Culmination of the past and the founder of a new future. He is the, the pivot point, the fulcrum of history. What do I mean by that? Well, first of all, let's look at being a culmination, the fulfilment of the past. Peter talks here of, of David, David being a great character of the Jewish faith. And everyone looked back to him uh, as that great hero of the faith. But as Peter says here, he died and his body, his remains lie in a tomb. Uh, he may even be um, hinting at the fact that that tomb could be visible from here, um, as he says in verse 29. And David looked forward to a, a descendant who would be more significant than he was. That's in verse 30. He also spoke prophetically in the Psalms, Psalm uh, 16, of one who, whose body would not decay. And he spoke of one coming as my Lord. That's uh, quoted by Peter in verse 34, which is actually a quote of uh, Psalm 110. So Peter underlines the fact that Jesus is greater even than David. Uh, he's the promised one who's been waited for 
the fulfilment of all those wishes. He is Lord and he is the Messiah, the anointed one, as I said, that they have been waiting for. He says that in verse 36. Of course, as Messiah, he does look a little bit different from what people were expecting. My mind goes to uh, Paul's letter to the Romans and chapter 10. Uh, verse four, where Jesus is described as the um, culmination of the law. Some translations say the end of the law, but it's more uh, more accurately the um, the fulfilment, the um, completion. As I said, the culmination of the law. The law was pointing towards Jesus as the one in whom uh, the law would be embodied, but the law would be uh, fulfilled. And Peter uh, unpacks that uh, in this talk. So he, Jesus is the culmination of what's come up to then in history. But he's also then the founder of a new future. Jesus is the fulfilment of past expectations, but also the founder of a new way. So in verse 33, Peter says, Jesus receives the Holy Spirit from the Father and he pours out what you see here. All these manifestations that uh, people were seeing on that first day of Pentecost, and which we see in different shapes and forms and times since. Again, John puts it this way when he describes the Holy Spirit, the one who's poured out here, as another helper, another advocate, one who is called alongside to help. That's John 14, uh, verse 16. The Spirit is the way that Jesus was with them on that day, and the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, is the way that Jesus is with us today, uh, 2,000 years later. Not only that, but Jesus flings accessibility wide open. We've thought in the past about the, the, the curtain of the temple being torn in two. Here Peter reminds us that, that what Jesus did and the coming of the Spirit here at Pentecost was first of all for all Israel, verse 36, but also beyond that, he says in verse 39, the promise is for you, your children and all who are far off. And that is radical thinking. This is a game changer. This is a world changer. The promise is for you, for your children and all who are far off. They receive the promise. And what's the promise? As it says in verse 38, the promise uh, is um, the gift of the Holy Spirit. Once they have repented, once they have rethought their life uh, and they've been baptised. So we have this great pivot in history as Jesus is the culmination of the past, but also the founder of a new future. That year was the most significant of all. And of course, there have been other significant years over history. Uh, perhaps the collapse of the Roman Empire, uh, maybe the Reformation, uh, maybe American independence, maybe China's cultural revolution, maybe the collapse of the Iron Curtain. Each of you will maybe think of uh, others that you might think are particularly significant. And another we need to add to that is 2020. I wonder what history will focus on when history looks back on this year. But surely it's a game changer. It's a game changer for society. If you think about it economically, what is the economy going to look like? How long is it going to take for us for the economy to recover? How is the workplace going to look different uh, in terms of home working, etc., in terms of our, our shopping habits? But also educationally, uh, what's going to change? What is going to look different about schooling in the future, I wonder? Socially, things are surely going to change. How are we going to relate to each other in the future? How are we going to get back into physical contact and being comfortable about just hugging one another? Um, is it going to affect how we take our holidays, where we choose to go, how far we choose to travel? One very minor thing that um, uh, 
when you think about it, it's a it's a fairly strange custom. Um, and I can't imagine us ever going back. Maybe it's only me ever going back to on someone's uh, birthday, uh, sticking sticks of burning wax into their cake and then inviting the birthday boy or girl to blow their germs over the whole cake uh, for us then to eat. Uh, it's a fairly strange custom when you look at it that way. I can't almost imagine us ever going back to that. Um, but it's a game changer this year medically in terms of how we respond to things, how we treat things. I know some GP surgeries are looking at phone interviews and how that will work into the future. Uh, it's a game changer surely politically as our trust in politicians is, I would dare to suggest, further eroded. And of course, as we think of society, into this has re-exploded, quite rightly, the issue of race relations. And I wonder, is this another false dawn in the move forward of race relations? Or, or have we, uh, are we embarking upon a real sea change? Only history will tell. So if this year is a game changer in society, then surely it's a game changer in the church as well. The what of the church must not change. The centrality of Jesus, the centrality of uh, our Trinitarian God. But the how? The how? How's that going to change? It's a bit like, you know, the present mustn't change, but the packaging uh, can change. Um, what new wineskins are going to be used and needed? So how is what we do going forward? Already we're doing our services very differently. Already I'm preaching here uh, to um, something that when I bought it, I thought it was for making phone calls primarily and have discovered it's actually really useful for filming um, sermons. Uh, what will we want to keep of this new way that we're doing things? What will of the old will we be desperate to have back? But what of the old stuff can we actually do without? On that subject, if uh, you are someone who receives communications regularly from CTK, uh, tomorrow you will be receiving a little bit of a questionnaire that we're asking some of these questions about what's good about the current, what are we looking forward to moving back, what won't we? Uh, it's not a definitive answer. Uh, we might think differently in a couple of months, but we want to ask you that question. But if this year is a game changer uh, for society, a game changer for the church, is it a game changer for ourselves? Is it a game changer for you personally? As we've been uh, called upon really to rethink all our relationships, to rethink our relationship with family, to rethink our relationship with friends, how we relate to them, to rethink our relationship with God. If you're not someone who was regularly an attender uh, on Sundays at Christ the King uh, before lockdown and you're watching this well perhaps that's what's happening with you you're rethinking your life and that's why you're engaging with what we're doing online because lots of course has been stripped away and when we strip away a lot then that causes us or gives us the opportunity to revisit our priorities you see the listeners to Peter when they'd heard him they said what shall we do how shall we respond? And Peter said, rethink. That's what repent means. Rethink things. Go for a new start. That's what being baptised is all about. Receive forgiveness that's been won for you on the cross by Jesus. And receive the Holy Spirit to equip you to live. 2020 is surely a game changer in society, in the church. Is it a game changer for you? I came across a poem a couple of weeks ago uh, by someone called Leslie Dwight, who wrote it in response to there's a few bumper stickers and things going around going 2020. Um, uh, let's reboot and start again. You have a virus uh, and a kind of play on words with computer speak. Um, but Leslie wrote this and said, what if 2020 isn't cancelled? What if 2020 is the year we've been waiting for? A year so uncomfortable, so painful, so scary, so raw, 
but it finally forces us to grow. A year that screams so loud, finally awakening, awakening us from our ignorant slumber. A year we finally accept the need for change. Declare change, work for change, become the change. A year we finally band together instead of pushing each other further apart. 2020 isn't cancelled, but rather the most important year of them all. Powerful words. As you look in your rearview mirror, looking back, how big is Jesus in the picture? How much does he feature? And then when you look ahead into the windscreen, looking forward, when you see an uncertain road ahead, how much does he feature? He made the claim that I believe is true, that he is the way. He is the way, the truth and the life. Maybe this period is an opportunity amidst all the pain, the uncertainty, the anguish of allowing him to take a greater place in our life. Or maybe even to take a place for the first time. Let's pray. So as we stop, as we pause, today is an opportunity for a new start, an opportunity to reboot, to rethink self. So much is uncertain, isn't it, in this world, but Hebrews 13, 8 reminds us that Jesus is the same yesterday, today and always. So how much does Jesus feature in your life and in your priorities? Maybe he is large in the rearview mirror. Maybe he's not there at all. Where is he in the windscreen? What about the future? I want to give us an opportunity this morning to do two things. One is to just get, ask God's Holy Spirit to be at work in us, to refill us, but also an opportunity to commit either for the first time or to recommit for the umpteenth time to Jesus. We can do it again and again and again. But of course, remember what Peter said in this verse. In verse 38, he said, repent and be baptised and you will receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is here to help us. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would come, that you would fill each one of us afresh this day. Breathe your life into our tired bodies. Breathe your refreshing spirit into our confused and sometimes hectic lives. As I was praying earlier, I had a, a picture of an orange that had been squeezed with no life left in it, needing refilling with juice, with energy, maybe even with purpose. I wonder whether that is you this morning. If it is, I encourage you to ask God by his spirit to refill you, to help you with a new start, a new purpose that is Jesus focused.
Come Holy Spirit, inspire us and refill us. As I said, I'm going to use some words of a prayer. It's a prayer of commitment. And I'm going to say a line of this prayer at a time and I'll leave a space then. And if you would like to make that prayer your own, you can either say it out loud, if that feels appropriate, or just in the quietness of your own heart. Either is absolutely fine. Lord Jesus Christ, I am sorry for the things I have done wrong in my life. Please forgive me. I now turn from everything that I know is wrong. Thank you that you died on the cross for me so that I could be forgiven and set free. Thank you that you offer me forgiveness and the gift of your Holy Spirit. I now receive that gift. Please come into my life by your Holy Spirit to be with me forever. Holy Spirit, please help me to place Jesus as a priority in my life from this day forward. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. If you have prayed that prayer for the first time, we'd love to hear from you and um, get to know you a bit better and help you with the next steps. If that's you, do contact us on our email address or via our website. We're now going to turn to our final song. And it's a song which reminds us that when we come to Jesus, we become part of his family, we become children of God, so that we no longer need to fear. Fear does not hold us anymore because love has called our name. Let's worship together.
Been great to worship God together today. We may be scattered, but the Holy Spirit is with us. We may feel isolated, but we are part of something bigger, God's church. If there's anything you want to follow up from today's service, or if you want to know anything particular or would value a chat, please do contact us on our email address or go to our website. The details are on our screen now. But for now, a final prayer of blessing. May Christ's holy, healing, enabling spirit be with you and guide you on your way at every change and turn. And the blessing God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with you this day, with all whom you love this day and always. Amen. And so let us go in peace, to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.